So today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the title is Democratizing Drug Discovery Deep Chem. Now, it's a bit ambitious of a title, but the goal really is to make it easy for anybody who's interested to start using the deep learning techniques that our labs and other labs are using kind of in drug discovery projects. So a lot of my talk today is sort of tied into the presentation BJ gave earlier today, where he kind of gave these very high level uh, pictures of some of the research that we've been working on. So the goal for, that I have for this talk is to really present this research in more detail, but at the same time provide kind of insight into the software that underpins this and kind of show you how uh, all of you can try using these same techniques in projects you've got going on. So uh, before we start, um, a lot of people have worked on the software. Uh, here's a picture of a number of folks who worked on it, um, many of whom are in the audience. Um, so there's been a lot of contributors worked on various parts of the back end, various parts of the science. Um, so this is certainly not just uh, my work, but the work of many people that I'll be presenting. So kind of as a bit of an origin story for the use of uh, our use, lab's use of uh, deep learning drug discovery. We did this collaboration with Google on looking at the use of massively multitask networks uh, in drug discovery. Uh, I think Vijay touched on this a little bit, but I'll kind of repeat the points. Uh, there's the goal, the problem we were trying to solve there was virtual drug screening. The idea is that you have some assay that you use to study um, some system. You have some collection of data points from this assay. And given this collection of data points, you want to build a model of what else is going to be active in that assay. And this has been uh, solved by the problem of virtual screening for quite some time, where you, you'd use simple machine learning methods to build a model of this sort of system. Now, kind of the insight was saying that instead of using simple machine learning systems, why don't we try to use deep learning? And the place we started from was very classical chem informatics. We said, let's represent these compounds using these Morgan fingerprints, these ex uh, or extended connectivity fingerprints as they're known in the literature. Basically, it's a simple way of encoding a molecule as a binary bit vector. So for anybody who's done, say, a little bit of natural language processing, this is pretty analogous to uh, what's called a bag of words model in natural language processing. Here, it's more like a bag of fragments. We say that a molecule is made up of a bag of local fragments that represent the functional subgroups. We took kind of um, this approach to featureizing. We applied it to whole uh, swaths of public data that we scraped from online. So in total, we scraped something like 250 assays. There's something like 40 million data points in total. And most of the assays had tens of thousands of data points uh, when we pulled them down. We then took all this data, we fed it into what we called a massively multitask network. The idea is that you build one model that attempts to predict the activity of compounds in all assays that are available in our system. So the idea is kind of as uh, Brian was pointing out in the previous uh, talk, we want to use the fact of common activity in multiple assays as a way of understanding the behavior of these compounds. And the deep multitask networks provide a systematic statistical way of exploiting these similarities and making good use of them. So having built these models, we got some nice results. I won't go into the table in depth too much since we've already talked about it a bit uh, before. But Basically, it provides a nice boost over the baseline, and we compute it comes out to something like almost a 30% reduction in error uh, on these benchmarks. Um, so something like, I think, average 0.8 error to 0.85-ish after we apply the new system. So this all looked very good. It was like, okay, we have a dramatic boost in uh, the power of our systems. And in fact, we did some cutaway studies. We said, how dependent are these models on the number of assays available and the total number of data points? And it, it turned out that our models showed a capacity to keep learning. We thought, OK, as we keep adding in more data, as we keep adding in more assays, these models will figure out everything and you know, drug discovery will be solved and we'll go home. Now, that obviously didn't happen. And there's a number of very interesting reasons why this research, while interesting, cannot yet have the type of impact we'd like it to have. And the goal of this talk really is to present our kind of solution to the problems that we came, in, uh, came across after building this work and hopefully provide it as a base for other people to use to make uh, further contributions here. So the question is, why? what's wrong with the work that I just presented? Now, there's, I'd say, two classes of 
uh, issues that we ran into afterwards. The first was software-based, the other was research-based. So I'll kind of go into the software first. The system we built previously was very brittle. Basically, we took all these assays, we featureized them with these circular fingerprints once, we stored them kind of in this cloud storage bin, and we did this once, I think, a year ago, and we never touched it again, more or less, because it was such a pain to run it. Then we specified the deep nets. This is using Google's old uh, initial deep learning platform from five years ago. And this is a very brittle platform. Defining a new type of deep net took hundreds of lines of code. It wasn't in a programming language. It was in this, these config files that you had to painstakingly tune and which had poor documentation. And the other part was it wasn't easy to manipulate or work with this data. So even if we wanted to change the experiment slightly, so for example, somebody asked, well, what if instead of classification problems, as we did, could you predict regression things for me? Could you predict IC50s or um, PKs or uh, all these related quantities, which qualitatively they're not that different, but when we actually tried to do it, it turned out we had to rewire half the system to get it to happen. So there's a lot of these fragility issues. We couldn't take the system, we couldn't use it to solve other problems. Now that said, there's more fundamental questions research-wise, which is we use 40 million data points. And as VJ and others have mentioned, you don't have 40 million data points. You don't even have 50,000 data points or sometimes not even 500. So are these deep learning techniques really going to be useful if they're so requiring of data that only YouTube cat videos have enough quantity to make them happen? And the goal of some of the work we did was saying, can we find a way to use deep learning but without using requiring the extreme amounts of data that these techniques seem to require till now. And kind of the approach we took to attack these two problems was, we said, we kind of think that the software is actually what's blocking us from solving the research question. Because it's so hard to do these experiments, it's really hard to, to come up with new ideas and test them. So by creating high quality software that makes it easy for us to iterate, to try ideas, to look at different things, we make it easier for us to um, attack the fundamental research questions, the mathematical statistical issues that uh, prevent us from extending these techniques. So part, this is kind of what started uh, me personally working on Deep Chem. The idea is we want to make an open source library that makes it easy to do this sort of drug discovery. Um, here's just some information about it. The docs for DeepChem live at deepchem.io. All development's done on GitHub. Um, everything's basically uh, used publicly. To use it, it's pretty easy. You use it much like any other uh, Python library. You say import DeepChem as DC, and from there, you're basically off and going. And underneath the hood, what really powers DeepChem is uh, TensorFlow. So for those of you who haven't heard of it before, TensorFlow is Google's new uh, deep learning language, I'd say. It's a library for manipulating tensors and performing various operations upon them and using them to define these very sophisticated functions which you can then do calculus with. Now, the ability to do tensor calculus is extremely powerful because as anybody who's done a lot of physics can tell you, physics is really nothing more than a series of tensor calculus equations. So having an automatic tensor calculus engine is an extremely powerful primitive and it allows us to build these quite sophisticated models and to iterate with them rapidly. So for those of you who haven't worked with TensorFlow before, I highly recommend it. It's really the foundation on which our library is built. So I kind of presented all the research we've done at Google. And what I'm saying here is this slide with 40 lines of code is basically capable of duplicating <coughs> essentially all the work we did at Google. Now, it's hard to follow even this small chunk of code. So I'm going to break it down over the next few slides. But the real point is that Having gone from something which I think was about 10,000 lines of code at Google, by building up this framework, we're able to take something that's 40 lines of fairly readable code and basically get the same results as we could with this custom system. Now, one caveat, you do need a GPU. In the new deep learning world, every, without a GPU, nothing can happen. But it's about 1,500 bucks, so fairly affordable. So with a modern GPU for a couple thousand bucks and 40 lines of Python, you can duplicate the research we did at Google with, I think, 50 million CPU hours or something. We had a number up on a blog. So this is the goal of DeepChem, was really making it easy for us to duplicate the work we'd done at Google and kind of extend it to other folks in the community. So basically, there is a fairly simple user interface behind it, but there's a lot of thought and structure that went into making this to a point where we could 
use the same framework for doing multiple projects and not just make it something that was a one-off. So kind of the goal of the rest of the talk is I'm going to go a little bit into the deep chem design, but not too long because I think what people really want to see is the research. So I'm going to then jump into kind of talking about the research, but at the same time, peer back the curtain. So you can kind of see that underneath the research, you can see, say, the not terribly complicated Python code that enabled these sophisticated deep models to be built. And the hope is that some of you will say, well, I should go out and try this library myself and build your own even more sophisticated and even more uh, useful deep models by using these as primitives. So the first step in kind of any of these machine learning systems is you want to take input data from somewhere and you want to featureize it. That is, you want to transform the input data into a format that's convenient for these deep models to understand. So for those of you who worked with Pharma, you know Pharma likes Excel spreadsheets. So oftentimes people might say, all right, I have a spreadsheet, has some list of compounds I've tried, and some experimental output. Can we handle that? Yes, very easy. And basically these few lines of code say, all right, I get, let me get my data loader. Let me load up the data that I have. Let me specify a featureizer, which is a way of transforming the data. And I'll featureize the data, and bam, I'm done. So basically, 10 lines of code to process uh, input of the standard format that you might see in a pharmaceutical application. And we basically accept CSV files. You can also have SDF files. And you can also, if you're more savvy and want to do something non-standard, if you can get your data into NumPy arrays, we're fine with it. So any standard Pythonic way or pharmaceutical way of processing data, we are usually capable of getting that off the ground. And we have examples, actually, I think we have close to a dozen examples of different data sets being processed with the system. We also have a whole load of featureizers. So a featureizer is basically something that takes in, say, a molecule and transforms it into a mathematical representation. The circular fingerprint is one that I talked about a bit, but there's a whole load of other featureizers that we have available. There's very simple ones such as, say, the molecular weight, which just lists down the molecular weight and a couple other basic descriptors. There's more sophisticated ones. There's uh, Coulomb matrices. So there's a whole line of work. Somebody asked about quantum. The Coulomb matrices are a way of, say, uh, representing the charge structure of a compound that turns out to be very useful for predicting, say, things like basic quantum properties, like homo-lumo gaps or something like that. Uh, we have ways of processing structural input. Um, for example, the grid featureizer lets you take in a protein ligand uh, complex and process that into a vector. So the goal is by building up this high quality library of featureizations, of ways of processing and transforming chemical input, we make it easy for other people to do because it's not easy to build these things. And we built off a lot of work from the RD kit folks and others, but we've also added a lot on top to make it easy for people to use. Um, data sets. We provide a data set uh, object. At the simplest, it's a simple wrapper over NumPy, which is basically the standard language of machine learning nowadays. But sometimes you want giant data sets. We have one collaboration where we have data sets of 100 gigabytes. And uh, we have an implementation that we use quite easily. And actually, quite under the hood, you can barely tell you're working with a 100 gigabyte object. And makes it quite easy to handle and process these giant data sets. Um, another transformation. So one detail about, say, the massively multitask networks that often is missed in the presentations is you actually have to do some fairly elaborate data transformations. Because most of the assays have very few positive examples, one trick you play is you say, I'm going to take the positive examples, then I'm going to take the negative examples. This is typically a 1 to 50 ratio. Then I'm going to multiply the weight of the positive examples 50-fold so that they have commensurate uh, influence on the network compared with the negative examples. And back at Google, we had, I think, a MapReduce transformation or something, a complex bit of custom code to enable us to perform this transformation. But here we just say, have this one line thing. We say, make a transformer and then transform a data set. So again, the goal we're going for here is we want to build up a library of common primitives that makes it easy for people to do what they like to uh, with these models. So there's not just one transformer, there's a whole bevy of transformers that support various standard types of transformations covered in the literature. So 
For example, Google had a recent paper on the system they used to process YouTube videos. And this had a very non-standard type of transformation called uh, CDF, continuous, uh, I mean, cumulative density function transformation. And for example, we have an implementation of that in Deep Chem, and we're playing with that for a particular project we've got ongoing. So the idea is really build up this library of primitives so you can mix and match and build these more complex models. Um, the next step, of course, is you have, if you have a machine learning model, you need some way of saying, does this model really, really work? And it turns out that most of the ways people do this in uh, standard machine learning, say randomly splitting the data, isn't necessarily that informative. Perhaps you want to split the data by chemical scaffolds. You want to say, train on uh, the most common scaffolds you've seen and check if the model generalizes to unseen chemical scaffolds. Well, you can do that. That's basically a one-liner. So the idea is, again, we offer this uh, whole list of, of uh, various splitters we found useful in different projects. And if you've got, say, uh, a new application, it's very easy to make your own new splitter. So again, the strategy comes over, ag over again. We want to build this library of primitives. And once we have this library of primitives, it's very easy to define standard models. So we have, say, a high-quality implementation of a multitask deep net. So these 10 lines of code, say, will basically define uh, networks very similar to those we built with Google with hundreds of lines of config code. And we make it easy and fast for people to try out these sophisticated models on their own data sets. Also, as an aside, the fact that we have this unified framework means that you don't have to just try one type of model. If you want to, say, use random forests on these same types of data sets, that also turns out to be pretty easy. Because again, it's this mix and match. You have little Lego blocks that you can kind of slot in and out of the code. And by the way, for anybody who's interested in following along, most all this code is basically pulled directly from the working example set uh, on GitHub. So there's no need to like squint at the code. You can just go to GitHub and check it out for yourself. Or better yet, try cloning it and try playing with it yourself. Um, and again, if you want to fit a that model, very easy. Define a model, say fit, and if you want to save it, say save. That's about it. So we've kind of gone over this laundry list now, I think, of a whole list of these primitives. But the goal really is that we're defining a language that we can use not in one, just, just for one paper, but for, say, n projects. Because by mixing and matching the primitives, we can kind of build these more useful tools. So I'll kind of speed through the next couple slides. We have some metrics. Any metric you want to think of, we basically offer it either as a wrapper into scikit-learn, which has a library of metrics, or metrics of our own, which we are more chemically aware. Um, and if you want to evaluate a model, we now have easy ways of evaluating these models and making uh, do with them. So now that I've kind of rushed through the very software engineering part of the talk, we can kind of see how we actually use this library to uh, do actual research. So now I'm going to talk about two papers that Vijay touched on briefly earlier in the, uh, the day. And I'm going to explain the science that was done in these papers. But every so often, I'll kind of peer back the curtain and let you see how the science was done so we actually were able to build these models. So the first paper that I'm going to talk about is um, a collab joint collaboration with Pfizer. It's a, the goal was to model inhibitors of the base 1 enzyme. So this is an enzyme linked to Alzheimer's. We scraped a lot of papers available on the internet. We found something like 1,000 inhibitors that have been reported in various parts of the literature, and we built this data set. But rather than doing the usual machine learning split, say we take 80% of the data for training and use 20% for testing, we did the opposite. We said, let's take 20% of the data, say only 200 compounds, and let's take the remaining 800 and use them to validate the set. Can we still do useful things with only 200 data points? Uh, because if you recall, the earlier research we'd done required tens of thousands of data points. Now we're saying, what if we have only 200? And basically, what we used was, we used Deep Chem as a way to build these varieties of models. So we built random forests, we built deep nets, we made them uh, quantitative, that is, uh, regression models. We also built classifiers. And all of this is very easy. It turns out to be something like the entire code for the machine learning part of the paper is 80 lines of code, and it's actually public. So you can clone the code and try duplicating the results from the paper yourself. Um, so here's kind of the picture of the binding pocket. So just to give some understanding of the system, here's one crystal structure of uh, one particular ligand. Um, so this is kind of the sort of system we're trying to understand. 
we kind of followed a standard uh, pharmaceutical workflow. Basically, we got this data. We want either a qualitative or a uh, quantitative model. We use some descriptors and we use various methods. So one thing we did in this work was we pitted the machine learning workflow against more standard tool chains. So I know there's some folks from Schrodinger. So we use some Schrodinger tools. We use some other commercially available tools common uh, in the drug discovery uh, pra uh, practitioner's toolkit. And we pitted it against machine learning with small amounts of data. And the question is, how well does machine learning do when used in this more real world uh, workflow? And there is a lot of numbers on this table, I'll summarize. The bottom two rows are the ones used with machine learning. You get a nice boost when building classification models with um, random forest or deep nets. And it's not that much more accurate, but it's certainly in the ballpark and I think slightly better, something like a few percent better. I'd say I'd honestly call it a wash, but the, the takeaway story is that even with only a couple hundred data points, m random forest and simple deep nets can do nice things for you. Uh, this is on a qualitative setting. You want to predict whether something's an inhibitor or not an inhibitor. What if we go to a quantitative setting? So this comparison is actually a bit more interesting because except for the random force in the DNN, the other uh, methods use the information <laughs> about the receptor structure. So the other, comp uh, the other methods use things like 3D physical calculations that use information about the receptor's physical structure and feed that into the network. Whereas the random forests and the deep nets use only purely uh, ligand-based methods. Now, they do slightly worse than the other methods, but it's very much in the ballpark. So the idea, the takeaway is that purely chemical informatic methods combined with simple machine learning and a couple hundred data points are powerful enough really to match or sometimes exceed the standard toolkits that people use in the pharmaceutical Can you industry. Just show us what we should be looking at and like to compare. Of course. Um, so if you look at see the this is could be a laser. Ah. So this is the random forest. This is the validation set. So these numbers here I think and these numbers here. There's two types of data. So there's the white and the, the yellow. The white is the data from the 2080 split that I mentioned. The yellow, I believe, is from the 80-20 split. We said what happens when you give the machine learning methods even more data. So under the uh, 2080 split, the deep nets do roughly comparable with the commercial toolkits that are available out there. With the 80-20 split, I believe it becomes a route. The uh, machine learning methods start dominating everything else out there. But that's kind of a standard expected effect. As you have more data, the machine learning models start to do quite nicely. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was just wasn't sure what I was comparing to what. Yeah, this is a uh, this is a very dense table, um, hard to talk about. But the basic idea is that we do comparable with small amounts of data, with with large amounts of data we start dominating. So the idea is machine learning works even with a couple hundred data points. With uh, closer to a thousand data points, you start dominating the other methods out there. So the takeaway, the goal we wanted to kind of present to uh, the chemical informatics community was you should be using more machine learning. It's not as data dependent as you might think. And even with a couple hundred data points, all things work out nicely. So what was actually going on behind the scenes in terms of software? What were we actually doing? It turns out this is sort of the simple deep chem script that we use to build these models. We uh, defined a various scikit-learn models. We use the, the deep chem hyperparameter searching utility. That is a tool for searching over various uh, model parameters that define the, deep th the machine learning architecture. And we evaluated these models to see how well they did. So the fact that we could, with say, three lines of code, swap between various machine learning models and various methods of evaluation, be they quantitative or, classi uh, uh, or classify, uh, classification, made it very easy to kind of develop and design these models and kind of use them on an interesting application. Now, that said, I kind of think that's not the most exciting thing that you can do with Deep Chem, because what we built in the previous paper was cool, but it was sort of something you could have done with, say, a standard toolkit like scikit-learn plus RDKit. Now, the question is, when does the power of the deep methods really start to uh, come to play? And the, our recent paper using one-shot learning is, I think, a great example of when you really do need the full power of a tool chain like Deep Chem.
So the power, the, the fundamentals that underlie the idea of one-shot learning is we want to use a way to transform molecules into continuous vectors. This is an idea that's been explored by kind of other folks in this space. Um, and it's, I think, going to be a very influential idea that by taking a discrete structure such as a mo molecule and transforming it into this continuous vector space, you can begin to do very uh, interesting transformations. However, in order to do this type of transformation, you do need a basic library of primitives. Um, so as kind of Vijay mentioned in the talk this morning, there's a whole line of work on what are called graph convolutions. So graph convolutions are ways of taking in arbitrary graphs. That is, say, think of a small molecule as an undirected graph with the atoms, the uh, nodes in the graph, and the bonds, the edges in the graph. Then how do we transform this into a continuous vector? We kind of do it by analogy with convolutional nets. So convolutional nets are a very powerful tool chain for taking in, say, image data and turning it into <coughs> continuous vectors. And this is sort of the technology that underpins much of the success of deep learning. Well, what is an image? You can think of it as a regular graph. It's a grid. Like, you, it's a bunch of pixels in an array, and the pixels have various properties. So the simplest way of thinking about an image is it's just a regular grid. So in that setting, all we've done is we've taken the traditional deep learning uh, toolkit, and we've generalized it mathematically to handle these arbitrary graphs, and we've run with it. And this is kind of work done by, I think, David Duvenaud, Stephen Kearns from our lab, other folks have built up these primitives. One contribution that we had to do in this work was, unfortunately, none of that code was really scalable or easy to use. Um, part of the code, say, belonged with Google. The other part, there was an open source implementation, but it wasn't GPU powered. So for those of you who worked with deep models, if it's not on a GPU, you can't really do anything with it at scale. So we said, OK, let's start making these primitives, put them on GPUs, and let's use TensorFlow to build up a high quality library of primitives. So we said, OK, let's get a TensorFlow implementation of these various systems. Let's make it easy to use. And let's say that you decide you want a graph convolutional model today. It's about 15 lines of code to design a sophisticated graph convolutional architecture. The idea is that we have a bunch of deep primitives in our uh, deepchem.nn module, or dc.nn. And to define a graph convolutional system, all you have to say is dc.nn.graphconv. Bam. And you say, add it to a model that I'm defining. So this is a design style that's begun creeping across a lot of the deep learning uh, literature. So the Curious Library, I think, was really our inspiration for using this sort of style. Um, it makes it very easy to build even the most sophisticated deep architectures with something like 20 lines of code. And in fact, this is live code. You can go check it out in our uh, examples repo and run it on the Talks21 data set. So by building up this library of primitives, it meant that we could take a graph convolutional architecture and we could reduce it to something that you don't necessarily need to understand all the mathematics behind the graph convolution. So long as you can go out and just clone our repo, you can use the same primitives that we've used and trust in our testing system and use them to build other new things. So it made it very easy for us to build upon the graph convolutional architecture. And having this convenient library of primitives was what enabled the more sophisticated parts of the research. So the idea I think we wanted to come back to is one-shot learning. So in one-shot learning, let's say these are the compounds. These are, let's say, data points we have about a particular experimental system. And notice there's five, there's like six data points here. That's not that much. Given six data points, how can we effectively learn any type of function? Well, the only type of learning rule that really works with that few elements is nearest neighbors. You say, all right, I have a new query that's coming in. Let me look through my evidence. Which one is it closest to? I'm going to go with whatever was the label for that one. So if you kind of have a baby and a giraffe, I think uh, uh, Jay mentioned his daughter and a cat. This is a similar principle, right? A giraffe is a new entity. The baby, having seen a giraffe once, might say whenever it comes across a new, uh, new animal, might say, is this a giraffe, yes or no? Comparison. If the comparison works, it's a giraffe. The comparison doesn't work, it's not a giraffe. Uh, I shared with this, um, an this story with uh, kind of one researcher who said, well, my daughter looked at a horse the next time, I believe, and thought it was a giraffe. So it doesn't quite work, but it's fairly accurate. The idea, the goal of the one-shot learning work is to really take this principle and make it possible to apply for molecules. And the primitive that, that underlines this transformation is the graph convolutional architecture. So when you see these 
lines that magically transform these compounds into vectors. Imagine a stack of code that is transforming this compound via a set of graph convolutional operations into a fixed dimensional vector. And once you have something in a fixed dimensional vector, you can use all the magical tricks of calculus to get out uh, the usual answer. So a lot of our inspiration for this project really came from work by Google. So there was the work on Siamese neural nets, and there was a follow-up uh, on what are called matching networks. So the insight some folks at Google had was they said, well, if we just embed, say, information about a data set, and a query independently, that's not that informative. We want the data and the query to kind of inform each other. We want to make context-aware embeddings. That is, depending on the query, I might want to process my data in a different way. Empirically, this seemed to offer some very nice performance. And to do this type of processing, uh, the folks at Google used two primitives. One's called a bidirectional LSTM, and the other is called an attention LSTM. These are unfortunately fairly sophisticated primitives. It's hard to get into the gory details of what it is they actually do. But I'll just note kind of two properties about them. The bidirectional LSTM is order dependent. The attention LSTM is not. It's order independent. Now, the unfortunate thing about this design is that the bi this is the processing for the data set. So imagine this set of compounds. That goes into this primitive called the by LSTM in Google's design. Um, this is kind of weird because there isn't a natural ordering to data that you have with you. You want some more uh, data in order independent way of processing the system. You really want the attention LSTM. Now, unfortunately, the attention LSTM is the query design. And the way, in order to create the query, they used the computed order-dependent embedding of the data. So we said, is there a way we can avoid this order uh, dependence in the system? And it turned out that to do this, you need to kind of interleave the, uh, the processing of the evidence with the processing of the query. And you come across uh, what we call this iterative residual LSTM architecture. Now, unfortunately, this architecture is a bit sophisticated and time is running a bit short. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to the punchline. But by the way, we have some, I think, very interesting diagrams that kind of display the process. Now, this is a sophisticated diagram. I don't know if I can do it justice in like the one minute I have. But the goal really is that you allow for the evidence and the query to interact with each other and inform each other. And by allowing this interaction, we evolve the uh, the locations of the molecules in the continuous space in a way that is maximally informative for the types of questions we'd like to answer. And when we tested these systems, when we looked at the, a couple of these data sets, we see these very nice boosts. So here is the TOX21 data set. It's a collection of uh, 12 assays. We took nine of these assays. We used it to build uh, these embeddings with these uh, residual LSTMs, and we tested it on the remaining three assays. And note that we test with a very limited set of compounds. Like up here, we're testing with 10 positive and 10 negative examples, but down here, we're testing with one positive and one negative example. So, kind of a lot of these questions about bias, about design of libraries, become very interesting. If you can make systems that effectively learn and answer queries when you only have two bits of evidence, now that's, that's a fairly useful primitive. And we show that we can achieve high predictive power by the use of this metric learning, even when you have very limited evidence. And we also did the same experiment on the CIDR collection. It's a collection of very high level data, as in patient reported adverse side effects to actual FDA approved drugs. So this doesn't come from an assay. This comes from patient reports and aggregated in the literature. So the fact that we were able to still do quite nicely learn this very high phenotypic property from very limited data makes it very, kind of shows the power of uh, these one-shot methods. Now that said, they're not magical. Uh, on the MOV collection, which is kind of up here, we have structurally diverse compounds. And here the methods begin to struggle. We can't generalize as powerfully to things that are different scaffolds, structurally different from compounds we've seen. And when you try to transfer the learned metric to completely new realms, it starts to break down. So we said, what if we train the metric on the TOX21 assay collection, and we try to predict the human side effect data 
in the CIDR collection. Turns out you basically get zilch predictive power. The distance metric useful for understanding uh, toxicity in the nuclear uh, receptor assays that make up TOX21 don't tell you that much directly about adverse patient side effects. It would be magical if they did, but it seems to be a limitation of the current generation. But now, kind of peering behind the system, I threw up a bunch of math. I said, here are these sophisticated models. How do you actually use these things? Turns out, 20 lines of Python code. And if you notice, the first 18 lines looks exactly like the graph convolutional system that I defined for you earlier. The only little bit, see these little three lines down here? That's the magic sauce. All we did was we gathered up our new system. We made it this residual LSTM layer. and it is that easy to use and define one of these systems. And again, this is actually one of the examples generated one of the data points that's actually in one of those tables. So this isn't example code. This is code that generated um, figures in our paper. So the really nice thing is we can take the power of DeepChem is it lets us take code that we use to actually generate research. And it's so clean that we can just plop it on a slide. And it's now a bit of example code for people to use. So the hope is that by making this library of primitives, we can make it easy for other folks to build upon our graph convolutional systems, build upon our one-shot embeddings, and start applying them to new realms and new spaces. Um, kind of with that, that's basically the talk is over. All the uh, docs are up on deepchem.io. Development's done on GitHub. Um, basically, the goal is we want to see other people using this and using this as a platform for drug discovery. and. We want to work with commercial users. If you want to use this for a commercial setting, we're happy to work with you. If you want to write a paper with us, even better. If you're an experimentalist, please come talk to me. Um, and that's about it. Thank you. Yes. Oh. A question on uh, the graph convolutions. Uh, so you said that you use the graph convolutions to transform the structure into this bit vector. How is that different from just like your, um, your, your fingerprint methods? And how is that better? It's a good question. I think the critical point is it's not a bit vector. It's a continuous vector. So instead of being in 0, 1 to the 1024, it's in R to the 1020, actually R to the 300 or something like that. So we allow more flexibility by allowing these real inputs. And I think the f another bit is that the embedding is not a bit of code that you just define once. It's a module that you can use and learn. You can learn a new embedding that depends on the problem in question. So instead of thinking of these graph convolutions as a fingerprint, think of them as a learnable fingerprint module that you can learn different fingerprints depending on the use case you have in question. So it's, it provides this degree of flexibility. I think that's the real power behind it. Oh, the question was, um, how does What's the advantage of a graph convolutional fingerprint with respect to a fixed fingerprint? And the answer is it's more learnable. Can you decode back from the continuous space to graph? That is a very interesting. Oh, the question is, can you decode back from the continuous embedding space back into molecular space? This is a very interesting question. Um, there's some very neat work uh, uh, called the molecular autoencoder by uh, David Duvenot, Alan Asper, Grusik, and some of their collaborators, they use kind of a bit of a hack to make this happen. It's a very clever hack, which I like. They say, well, we can write molecules down as smile strings. Well, from uh, a continuous representation and using standard natural language processing tools, you can write sentences. A smile string is a type of sentence. I'm going to write a sentence, and I'm going to discard the ones that aren't real molecules. So you can sort of embed it. I think it gives you about 25% of the time. It actually gives you a real compound back. You could probably connect one of those decoders with our encoder. Um, but it would be neat to, if we could have a more natural way of recovering molecules from the continuous space. And that's, I think, a very useful avenue for future research. <coughs> In the slides that you compared random forest and the Siamese network, so first, uh, it's not clear to me what does it mean to build the random forest with you know one positive example and one negative example. Yes. And second, did you try to compare in this case to a nearest neighbor method rather than random forest? We did not have. We, oh, the question is. Um, what does it mean to build a random force with one positive and one negative? And did we compare against the nearest neighbor? Um, so it is mathematically still well-defined, although, as expected, it's not 
It doesn't learn a useful function with only two data points. For nearest neighbor, the Siamese network is very close to a sophisticated nearest neighbor method. Um, it is basically a nearest neighbor algorithm. We just allow a deep net to inform the choice of distance metric. So this is probably an upper bound on what a nearest neighbor method would do because it is, in effect, a sophisticated nearest neighbor. And the residual LSTM dominates uh, the simpler Siamese networks in terms of performance. Um, so we do have reason to believe these are more powerful than simple nearest neighbor. It might be good just to do a KNN. Right? I think it would also be good to do uh, a KNN experiment for baseline. <coughs> so, um, the TOPS21 data set actually has duplicate data sets for things like androgen receptor <coughs> and estrogen receptor. When you're considering these uh, AUCs, are, have those been removed at all? That's a good question. The question is, there are assays in the TOX21 collection that are very closely related, like the androgen receptor and the estrogen receptor. Have those duplicates been removed? Uh, we did not explicitly control for that. If you check the appendix of the paper, you can see the actual split we used. Um, off the top of my head, I could not tell you. For the CIDR data set, I think the side effects are entirely distinct. So if you, there is reason to believe that a duplicate effect isn't the only thing that's explaining the performance, but it is something worth looking into and controlling for. Well, I mean, they have two different androgen receptor data sets. So if those aren't removed, you're basically predicting what's already in your training set, is my concern. I would have to look into that and let you know, but I don't think that the method is purely memorizing <laughs> because we do have other experiments that um, don't suffer from the same problem, but it's something worth looking into as we make revisions. This is a preprint, uh, but it's something worth looking into for the next revision of our paper. I think we have time for one question. So this is more just uh, kind of a thought. So the chemistry space is pretty unique and is famously discontinuous, right? Whether you look at them as chemical graphs, a smiles is just a chemical graph. It's, they're convenient because you can use string handling tools to manipulate them but most of your manipulations will produce nonsense, right? Um, just one of the things I thought about, Brian and John, and others might have thought about this too. His name, uh, John Louis Ramon, the guy that did GDB, he's up to what, like GDB 16, or I don't know how big it is now. How, how big? 70, 17. Yeah. Um, so this is an enumeration of all the theoretically possible chemical graphs with carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and a halogen. Uh, for sure it includes molecules in pharma and biotech we'd never care about, but at least they're, they're likely you know, molecules that could exist, right? So I wonder, rather than trying to represent the, you know, the discontinuous space by all the possible chemical graphs, you could in instead dip into that enumerated universe of all the chemical graphs that are possible. I hadn't really thought about that, and then maybe you would code that space and search through that somehow. So it's an interesting question. Um, I think the question is, what if we looked at the combinatorial structure directly instead of dealing with this continuous space? Because there, is, there are often these activity cliffs in which activity changes drastically with a simple addition. So in a more like, philosophical answer to this, underneath the activity cliffs, there's quantum mechanics. The wave functions are continuous regardless of um, the behavior of the discrete molecules themselves. So I think there is a reason to believe that a sufficiently sophisticated continuous space is capable of representing the complexity of small molecules. Now, the question is, of course, whether the continuous spaces we've devised are of that complexity. I don't know. But it's very, I think the reason we like working at these things is there are only 300 numbers. It's very convenient. It's m numerically very nice. And plus, calculus is easy, whereas discrete math is hard. So. It's sort of like we have, the lamp shows some light here, we're kind of digging out the ground beneath it. But you're entirely right that there might be more sophisticated phenomena we're missing because we don't have the mathematical tools to go there. Even at the QM level, there's nothing else that looks like a carbon-carbon triple bond. I, yeah, I mean, maybe another way to think about Jeff's point is, even in continuous space, we need to regularize such that we can enhance the, 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 the representations that are most like the discrete space. Yeah, that's that's one simple case, but when we deal with pretty frequently, you're trying to find a replacement for it. You know, medicinal chemists are fond of isosteric replacements. There's like one that's crummy for acetylenes, and that's it. It hardly ever works. And there's plenty of other examples. It's, it's what I mean by it being a discontinuous space. <coughs>
Thank you. Thank you. So again.